Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Uh, <coughs> this is a memorial for Harry Thomas. My name is Robert Weisler. I'm Harry's great nephew, or grand nephew. Uh, this is my cousin John, who is Harry's nephew. John's going to say a few words. Uh, I'm going to say a few words, and then we have Mr. Lee Harris here who's going to give us a little eulogy. Then I'd like. Uh, people here to stand up, you don't have to, strictly voluntary, and maybe give uh, your favorite Harry Thomas story. I'm sure there's, uh, everybody in the room probably has several, and it'd be nice to, to share them with one, one another. So, this is John. Okay. Thank you all for coming. As Robert told you, I'm uh, Harry's nephew, John Thomas. On behalf of the Thomas family, I would like to thank all of you for coming. Also for Harry's two older sisters, Anne and Louise, who couldn't make the trip to live in the East Coast, I extend their appreciation also. My early memories of Uncle Harry are his trips to our house when my father, John, uh, was his brother, was alive. Even though uh, they had come to California together and served in the Merchant Marines together, no two men could have been so different. The visits would start out quiet and end up in some kind of argument about eating healthy food or chiropractic remedies. Harry outlived my father by some 33 years now, so who was wrong and who was right? <laughs> the two of them have probably started in right where they left off. After my father's passing, I didn't see Harry as often as I'd wished, but Harry was always busy with his work. I really did not know how much work his men until after his passing. As Robert and I go through his belongings and relive the past 60 years, I realized what an exciting time Harry experienced in Hollywood. Quite frankly, he is a part of that history, as some of you already know. Many of you have passed by his home as we work to save some of that history and have told us many, many Harry stories. What a treasure he was. At times I felt sad Harry had no children of his own, but as I look around his home, I realize his work was his life and all of you are his children. Everyone who sat and that chair was one of Harry's adopted children. Who else could fix your hair, fix your face, crack your back, all in the same room? <laughs> Plus, don't forget the history lesson or philosophical discussion you were in for. In closing, I would like to thank Lily, the loving and patient person who watched over Harry for many years. Lily, as some of you know, was a dear friend to Harry and deserves all of our hugs and kisses for keeping Harry with us as long as he was. Thanks to all of you, and God bless you all. I want this to be kind of upbeat, not down, because that's how Harry was. Harry was probably the youngest person I know. You know I, I grew up back east in Philadelphia, and uh, you had a suit back there for two occasions, in case you had to go to a funeral or go to court. <laughs> Fortunately, I think I've been to court more time than, than I've been to funerals. Uh, my family, Harry was 87 years old. As I told you, Anna and Louise are in their 90s, so we have a, a wonderful family there. Uh, a lot of the people in the room, I, like John says, we've been going through Harry's papers. I recognize the names. Rocky, who uh, was very close to my uncle, I met on a commercial. I do some acting. And, and my story about Harry is I go in and I sit down in the makeup chair, and uh, you people behind the camera work all the time. Those actors only work now and then. And you, you're your own little family. And I'd say, yeah, by the way, do you know Harry Thomas? And all of a sudden, the, the costume people, the wardrobe people, the air people, from the grips to the, the transportation people. And I heard this. I, I, I heard that. That's Harry's nephew. Or, and things like that, which immediately made me feel comfortable and at home. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce Mr. Lee Harris, who's going to give us a little eulogy. And then I invite you all to share with some of your stories. Thank you. Can we uh, please open up with about a, a minute or so of silence for uh, Harry's memory? Okay, thank you.
I thought I'd better leave everybody to the privacy of their own of their own thoughts because if a prayer was uttered out loud for Harry at memorial service, he would come back and get us somehow. <laughs> I'm your understudy eulogist, by the way, uh, the guy who was supposed to do it, Joe Blasco, uh, Harry's uh, good friend and student and who runs the makeup school, uh, has a real bad back and he had to go into the hospital yesterday for traction and other treatment, not surgery, but uh, so just like in showbiz, uh, the main guy can't do it, so second banana fills in. Uh, this kind of reminds me of the end of 1977 when we were facing for the first time uh, Christmas without Bing Crosby, New Year's Eve without Guy Lombardo, and rock and roll without Elvis. And tomorrow night, unless you're in excess of 87 years old, will be our first Halloween without uh, our good friend Harry. He might have balked at that reference to the horror movie connection, because that, look at this stuff, and it seems to be his claim to fame. Uh, but he worked on every different kind of movie and entertainment thing there was for almost 60 years. If we listed singly all of Harry's accomplishments, we'd be here until about 7 o'clock in the morning, probably. Uh, you can see him in Laurel and Hardy's first feature film, Pardon Us, made in 1930 when Harry was just turning 21 years old. And although he was just coming of age, he already had so much character in his face that even if you knew him already as an older man, like this, he was instantly recognizable. He's standing right behind Oliver Hardy in the film, if you see it. Uh, I think Harry could have made it as just an actor. He once showed me photographs of himself as a dashing, uh, leading, young leading man kind of guy, um, taken in the late 20s. Uh, he was a dead ringer uh, for a George Raft or a Rudolph Valentino kind of character. Not so much the way he looks here, but when you come up and see the collage maybe after the service, the picture down there in the lower right, he really looks slick. It was during the 1930s that Harry learned uh, makeup. In Hollywood in those days, you could do just about any job without a union card, and Harry did. He worked as an extra. He worked on props. Another movie you can see him in is Scarface, 1932. Eventually, he started apprenticing himself to the wiser heads in makeup. Back then, the Westmore brothers and the legendary Jack Pierce, whose uh, makeup on Universal's movie monsters, Frankenstein, The Mummy, and later The Wolfman, uh, kind of, it would save the studio from, bank, from bankruptcy. And Harry, as Jack Pierce's gopher and assistant, was on the set of Bride of Frankenstein and some of the real biggies of that time. And Harry later repaid the favor several times over. By the 50s, Jack Pierce had become very cantankerous. And his old time makeup methods using Fuller's Earth and cheesecloth and collodion were outdated. And nobody, including Universal, would touch him. Nobody would hire him, but Harry did. Harry hired him to work on an old-time Western series in the 50s called Frontier. In 1936, uh, having gotten his ability going in makeup, uh, Harry found himself at MGM. He was holding the makeup tray for Greta Garbo on the set of Camille, which is now probably her most well-known film. And Harry, in telling me about this, would imitate her husky Swedish voice. And he said that, he kept, that uh, she kept telling him, Harry, Save your money. <laughs> <laughs> Harry said that his happiest experience in a movie studio was at Hal Roach in the late 1930s. He worked on Topper and movies like that. He'd turn up for work in the morning and go to the commissary and have breakfast with Hal Roach. And that kind of informal atmosphere Harry really thrived on because, you know, you didn't walk into MGM and have breakfast with Louis B. Mayer or Jack Warner over here. Harry was in the Merchant Marine. I don't have the dates right on this, maybe, but I know he was in in 1941. 1940, 41? Sound right? Family gallery? <laughs> anyway, I know that in 1941, he was in the Pacific when a ship full of Japanese sailors passed his ship. They're all smiling and waving. Two days later, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And Harry was convinced that these guys were in cahoots with our government to start World War II. He, he would say, I was there. Well, <laughs> whether it happened that way or not, he was there. And, uh, and one ship that he was on in the Merchant Marine was torpedoed and sunk. 
And he was lucky. He spent less than 24 hours in a lifeboat. Some passing ship uh, picked up him and some shipmates. But a lot of his uh, other shipmates didn't make it. Uh, back on solid ground back here in L.A., Harry studied chiropractic uh, during the latter part of the war, uh, earning his degree, his certificate and stuff is right over here, a program from his graduating ceremony from 1946. And between that and study on his own, Harry became an expert on human anatomy. I guess all of you probably know that. Uh, he retained more knowledge in that department than most practicing physicians. You know, unfortunately, sometimes Harry thought he was a practicing physician. There was, uh, <laughs> at one of these Ed Wood events about three or four years ago, people signing autographs and stuff, a real cute 20-year-old girl had just finished talking to Harry and comes up to me and says, Harry Thomas, the makeup man over there, he's also a doctor. <laughs> and I said, oh, did he tell that to you too? Does he want to examine you? <laughs> One of the all, oh, here, here's one of the all-time classic Harry stories. Uh, from 1955, he was working on a movie. Uh, Harry would call it a picture called uh, New York Confidential. In the movie was Celia Lovsky, who was married to Peter Lorre. Uh, she later played Lon Chaney's mom in Man of a Thousand Faces, and she was the uh, ruler of Spock's planet on Star Trek. In this movie, she was a matriarch of a big family who was dying. And she had a big death scene. And she kept insisting, Celia Lovsky kept insisting to Harry and the director of the film that she looked beautiful. Well, not very many people die in the full bloom of health, you know. Um, and Harry and the director were looking at each other like, not too sure what to do. Celia didn't trust Harry, didn't trust any of them. And she insisted on seeing herself in the mirror before she shot the scene. And so Harry reaches into his stuff and his makeup bag and everything. He pulls out a little mirror and walking over to her in the bed, he intentionally drops it. And Celia complains and Harry says, well, all my other mirrors and makeup equipment are on the other side of the lot. So Harry's uh, genius applied to the situation, worked. The director got his shot. Celia Lovsky, madder than hell. And, uh, <laughs> and the, because he, he, she, he had made her up uh, to look ghastly, and he was convincing her that he was doing glamour makeup. Now, I don't know if the broken mirror brought Harry bad luck, but in the seven-year period following that is when he started working for Ed Wood. Uh, actually, his connection there was more to the studio, where a lot of Wood stuff was shot, quality studios, down on Santa Monica Boulevard near Western. It's a little white building behind a bar called the Gold Diggers. And uh, Harry was friends with Merle Connell, who held the master lease on the place. And dozens of exploitation pictures were shot there over the years. And this is not so much the poverty row of conventional Hollywood, like you would hear about Gower Gulch and stuff. This is more like Skid Row, the <laughs> studio. Uh, because the history of these films, these exploitation films about BD and marijuana and female wrestlers and sleeping pill rackets, it's unchronicled, this kind of history. So it's difficult to nail down exactly which pictures Harry really did work on. But uh, suffice to say, he did lots of them. Uh, he used to say, no one worked cheaper than I, and no one worked better. Well, that was true. Some of the films that Harry did work on down there include the After Midnight series. Harris After Midnight, Hollywood After Midnight, Tijuana After Midnight. Uh, they were little more than filmed strip shows with the exotic dancing ladies and baggy pants comedians with their corny jokes. Uh, I did two films there with Lily St. Cyr, uh, Love Moods and Boudoir Fantasy, Dream Follies, French Follies, A Night at the Moulin Rouge, A Night in Hollywood with uh, Tempest Storm in it, Night on Bear Mountain, on and on. At the beginning of one film uh, made in 1958, Not Tonight Henry, which if you see, it's out on video, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, Harry appears in the opening credits, uh, shooting craps and dice with the other crew members. And he looked balder in that scene than when I knew him. You know, the sweeping the hair over. And uh, Harry told me on uh, repeated occasions that uh, besides his pay for those jobs, that doing full body makeup on famous strippers had some fringe benefits. <laughs> Harry, I clean
clean that up. Uh, while Harry did work on Ed Wood's films, Glenn or Glenda, Bride of the Monster, Jailbait, and Night of the Ghouls, Harry is most famous probably for a movie he did not work on, and that's Plan 9 from Outer Space. Uh, Wood didn't have the time or the money for Harry to create his elaborately planned makeups on the aliens, and they were elaborate, but they weren't ex really expensive. Harry just got furious and he quit. And later Harry admitted that what he called these he would complain and say, these, these beauty shop haircuts on these people and their Oxford accents on these aliens, they added to the film's cheesiness and notoriety because they looked like perfect earthlings, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but till the day he died, Harry was getting mail from all over the world about his Ed Wood work, and uh, he wasn't kidding. I saw the postmarks, Australia, France, Germany. They loved the stuff overseas in Europe. And he'd obligingly sign these photos and send them back to the fans, even though sometimes he had to pay the postage. And he seemed pleasantly befuddled by all this attention the, the Wood films brought him. Uh, but that was kind of tempered by his memories of Ed Wood being down on his luck. On several occasions, uh, Harry loaned Wood the money for his rent. And uh, when he was alive, he told me, gosh, don't tell anybody that, but I guess it's all our guilty secret. Harry often said that Wood was the opposite of the genie that comes out of the bottle, that he disappeared into it. <laughs> In the 60s and the 70s, Harry turned his work mainly toward television. Uh, his last makeup job was on the live stand-up comedy film Richard Pryor Live on the Sunset Strip. And it's no secret that Richard Pryor had uh, uh, sustained terrible injuries to his face while doing drugs and to make him acceptable to go before the cameras again they called in the old maestro and he did it when you see if you go rent the film at a video store you can't tell that anything is wrong with richard Pryor's face i came into harry's life pretty late in the game and when we interviewed him for our documentary flying saucers over hollywood the plan nine companion the title that harry cordially hated uh, he proved an interviewer's dream, really. He accurately and humorously recalled his days with Wood, and he played Happy Birthday Plan 9 on his, one of his harmonicas. And they're over here, too. I think it was the bigger one over there. Uh, many people who saw this documentary, by the way, who had never seen Plan 9 and never heard of Ed Wood, heard Harry's comments and the comments of the other people interviewed in the film, and they said that what struck them most is that it was a story of people. Um, that you really started to care about them and the lives they led and making movies on this kind of level and it kind of cast a new light on what uh, one writer uncharitably described as an entourage of day of the locust weirdos <coughs> and uh, my memories of Harry uh, really are of listening to his old Hollywood stories as he cut my hair in the little studio in the back of his house the shorter chair not this one over here. We'll have stories later about the magic chair here. Other people seem to know far more about it than I. Uh, I remember supporting Harry's weight on my arm here and really feeling the pull because his legs were so bad uh, when I took him to the doctor out in Woodland Hills or had him over to our house for dinner. And also, if you remember about Harry, he always smiled first with his eyes. If you looked at him, you know, each of his eyes would go into an individual little smile and the rest of his being would kind of light up. And I could always make him laugh with my impression of Tor Johnson. And we'd uh, have long talks about old Hollywood, especially the silent era, the real early days. I think back now, this, I have to do Tor at Harry's memorial service. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I would call up Harry. This was on the phone, but also in person. I'd call up Harry and I'd say, Hello, Harry, this is Tor. <laughs> and uh, yeah. in, this, in this very earnest voice, like it was really him, Harry would say, Why, hello, Tor. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Thinking back, this may seem like a vague connection to some of you, but I associate uh, certain signposts along Harry's life with uh, the silent movie actress Mary Pickford. He was born the year that she made her first film in 1909. When he first came to Hollywood in the 20s, he rented a room in a house on Western Avenue owned by, owned by Pickford's mother. 
And in that same house in 1958, he did makeup on uh, two horror films shot there, The Unearthly with John Carradine and Tor, and Terror in the Haunted House, which I think has Robert Clark in it. And a week ago Monday, Harry died in a house that was built by Mary Pickford as a real estate investment in the early 1930s. Harry expressed to me on numerous occasions that he was an atheist, that uh, he didn't believe in any god or deity or any survival of the spirit uh, or personality after death, but there's an old wheeze expression, to live in the hearts of those you leave behind is not to die. So by those standards, Harry will be around a long time, right? Lots of us first got to know him, or got to know his work before knowing who Harry Thomas was on a little black and white TV at three in the morning when we were kids, and on film and videotape and laser disc and digital media that hasn't been invented yet, his work will live on for future generations. Picture a kid in the year 3000 watching Frankenstein's Daughter. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wonderful documentary series that was done in 1979 called Hollywood the Pioneers. And for Harry's birthday last month on the 22nd, I gave him copies of all 13 shows. Uh, I'd given him copies of a few of them over the years, but not ever the whole thing, I don't think. And Harry really loved the opening title music to this show. Uh, just absolutely adored it. Uh, he had, Harry had a very musical soul, you know, he made up songs, he wrote songs for people. And any time I'd mention this documentary series to him, he would start whistling the theme perfectly, verbatim, note for note. And the last few times I talked to him, um, he said that he was watching these tapes over and over again. This is, uh, I would say, from his birthday on the 22nd of September for about the next three weeks. And uh, one of those tapes was in his VCR when he died. So whatever physical discomfort Harry was in, uh, he was, if you want to think of it this way, was kind of settling down to pleasant Hollywood dreams. So in his memory, here's...